Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. It's good to be heard. It's good to see you on this beautiful day. Wow. I think spring is really here and summer is tomorrow. All right, with 80 degrees. Wow. But don't get distracted, please, by the good weather and just vanish for the weekend. Stay with us, okay? We've got some important stuff covering tomorrow night and the next night. You don't want to miss it. Mother's Day, there's nothing happening here. So go to the mountains, go to the beach on Sunday, do whatever you need to do with your moms and celebrate, but stick with us until then, okay? That'll be our break, okay? Sunday. Otherwise, I hope you can be here the next few nights because these are some key topics that uh, Pastor Rob's going to be sharing. So we're just glad you're here once again. I even see a new, a new face or two. We're glad for those new faces. You are welcome here. And we hope you feel loved and that you are blessed by being here tonight. I'm confident that you will be. Uh, I'm Pastor Jared, as you know. Pastor Rob has been our speaker, and uh, you're going to be blessed tonight through the message. And it's one of the most important ones I think you're going to find out. But we want to do a quiz before we get to that message, Pastor Rob. So that turns on. So we'll give you one second here. It's coming in. It's coming in. Any second now. And oh, is it is it on mute or something? Is it a, no. It's what? It's on. Is this on? Can anyone hear me? No, not through the mic. No. Okay. I can share mine with you. Or I will do the first couple questions till your, till your mic gets going. How about that? Question number one, how are we saved? By keeping the law, by believing the horoscopes, by being perfect on our own, or by placing our faith in Christ alone? I'm seeing hands go up. Pastor Rob, I don't have the clicker, so I can't highlight the answer. But number four, by placing our faith in Christ alone. Yes. But the law will never save you, okay? You are only saved by one way, and that is by faith through Jesus Christ, period. Okay, we got that? Everybody's on the same page? Great, okay, number two. Your mic's still not still working. On? Oh, no, okay, yeah, come, here's the clicker. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see who's first. All right, question number two, here we go. According to Revelation 14, 12, what two things will characterize the people of God in the last days? They'll keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They'll be selfish and lawbreakers. They will be rich and successful, or they will be shy and humble. I'm seeing a lot of ones up in the air. And you are correct if you put up number one. Now, that's right from the Bible, by the way, Revelation 14, verse 12. Can't get much clearer than that. And we'll just keep rolling. Number three, the Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 4, that sin is equal to what? Having fun, lawlessness, freedom, or driving through a stop sign? I see fingers up. If my clicker will work. Oh, if I hit the right button, lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. This is law breaking, right? That's what sin is, very clear. Not just what someone's opinion is or what somebody else's opinion is. It's law breaking, breaking the law of who? The law of God, okay? Question number four, according to Revelation 12, 12, why is Satan so angry with the world and increasing his attacks? Because he's always late on Black Friday? Wow. Because he doesn't know Bible prophecy? Because he knows his time is short? Or no reason Satan is relaxed about the time of the end? 
Okay. I see a lot of number threes up there because he knows his time is short. That is right. Pastor Rob, do you have a microphone that works? I guess we're going to be using a handheld tonight. Okay, Fair I don't enough. Think this is working. So, um, question number five why don't we need to keep the Jewish festivals anymore? Is it A, be, or number one, because they are too difficult to plan for? Is it because we don't want to harm animals? Is it because Pastor Jared said so? Or number four, because they found their fulfillment in Jesus. <laughs> I hope everyone has the right answer. Number four, that is correct. Yeah, number four is the correct answer. Somehow he managed to put me in this quiz again. <laughs> but let me say a word now because my name's there. Is the pastor the authority for what you should believe? No. What is the authority for what you believe? Yes. The Bible, the Word Absolutely. of God. I hope you will take that away with you from this seminar. Mm -hmm. Even if you forget everything else we've said, remember the Bible's the authority. Not a pastor, not a priest, not a pope, not a king, not a president. The Word of God is the authority, right? Amen. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost ready to start preaching, Pastor okay, Rob. Okay, you Good can go Good thing ahead. your I'll microphone see. is working, <laughs> otherwise I would just launch into the sermon here. We need to pray, and then we're going to go right into the message tonight, and Orion is going to sing at the end, so don't uh, think we're skipping her tonight. She's going to bless us with a song at the end. Let's pray tonight, pray tonight as we begin. Father in heaven, you have been so good to us. You've blessed us with some beautiful weather now. We're enjoying the sunshine and warmer weather, and we're enjoying learning about the Word of God and the teachings of the Word of God that have been shared uh, almost since the last week. We are almost to the first end of the first week, and you've been good, Lord. You've been opening our minds and giving us better understanding, and I pray you'll continue to do that tonight. Bless Pastor Rob as he shares. Bless each person who's here, whether it's their first night or whether they've been here every single night, and help us have clear understanding of what your word says, because it is the authority uh, in our lives, and we want to get to know you better and follow you more because we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can I change, exchange that for you? Sorry, the little oh, yeah. clip is uh, in my hand here too. <laughs> we'll get there. All right, thank you so much, Pastor Jared. Um, all right, there we go. Well, we took a day uh, off, and it seems like I haven't seen you in so long. You look good. <laughs> it's only been one day, but my goodness, the weather has turned. It is so beautiful outside. I'm actually warm sitting up here with a, a suit jacket on. I might have to take that down, uh, take that off at some point. But what I'd like to do, because we kind of took a day break, is just to review quickly some of the things that we covered for the first five days. And it's important because the first five days was a bit of a stretch and what we've been doing over the five days that we met before our break is really laying that foundation down that we're going to be building on throughout the rest of the series. And you'll see, there's going to be many times as we go through these presentations that you will remember, oh yeah, he talked about that on night two, or oh yeah, he talked about that on, on night three. And so I want to make sure that you are up to speed, that we're all on the same page with the uh, sort of the topics that we've covered f over the first five nights. Night number one was how to overcome fear through Bible prophecy. We established at night number one that the Bible is trustworthy and God is too. How do we know? Because of prophecy. And in, the, in Daniel 2, what we covered night one, we looked at a prophecy that talked about the major world empires over 2,500 years. And if God knows the future, he knows your future too. And so we have nothing to fear. It's not, things aren't happening in the world that are just like, oh, that's a huge shock. We didn't expect this coming. God knows the future, and that is good news. Night number two, we talked about, if is there um, hope for our world? And the answer is yes, there is hope for our world, and the hope is Jesus Christ coming again. And while we don't know the exact date that Jesus is going to come again, he does tell us to watch for those signs in Matthew chapter 24. When you see them increasing in frequency and intensity, know that Jesus is almost here. Uh, okay, another one was why so much pain and suffering? We looked at the fact that God created us with the freedom of choice. Sin started in the heart of Lucifer in heaven, in a perfect place. He rebelled, came down to this earth, and now he is upset. 
He does not like God and the fact that he was kicked out of heaven. And so his war now is with you. And so he's trying to pull you in order, on his side, to kind of worship anything other than God. He doesn't care what you worship as long as it's not God. And that's why we have pain and suffering in this world. Um, on, on one of the nights after that, I'm, I lost track of which night is which, we talked about the good news about the final judgment. That there is a judgment and that that will happen or take place before Jesus comes. And actually, if we looked... If you look at the prophecy we talked about, the 2300-year prophecy, you will see that we are actually in the time of judgment right now since 1844. But the good news is, is that we have Jesus on our side. He is our advocate. He is our lawyer. And he is standing in heaven on our behalf. So that's the good news about the judgment. And then the last time we were together, we talked about this, how to experience peace. We looked at the law of God. And we established that Jesus never came to change the law. Jesus came to change what? Hearts. And so what we're going to do tonight as we dive deeper into this topic on the law of God, we're going to be talking about this topic, God's cure for stress. We're going to be looking a little deeper into the law of God, and partic in particular one law of God that, is, that has garnished a lot of undue controversy over the centuries a lot and right off the bat i'm so grateful that pastor jared mentioned what he said because everything that we're going to be looking at everything that we're going to be studying and and reading from and building our case for will be from the word of god i'm not here to share with you what popular opinion is i'm here to study the word of god that's what I think is true. That's what I believe is true. And so that's what we're going to be using as our study this evening. When I moved with my family in 2020, it was February of 2020. It was still a little cold. We moved from Canada all the way to Oregon. And uh, when I arrived, everything just shut down. Like I arrived February of 2020, and I think in a couple weeks, everything was shut down. And in my downtime, I mean, we were home, we couldn't really go out and do anything, so I thought, let me educate myself on what the history is of this amazing nation, the United States of America. I learned a little bit in school, but I wanted to learn more. What's the history? What's the, what's the story behind the American people? What is it that makes America, America, their, their background, their history? And so I turned to uh, Netflix and I started watching this show called America, The Story of Us. Anybody ever see this documentary? It's really good. It is fascinating, fascinating stuff. I learned so much about this nation from watching that show. I don't know how many episodes long, but it goes all the way from before the Civil War all the way through the industrial age and, and the exploration of the West, all the way to space travel and to beyond. It's a fascinating uh, documentary and I highly recommend that you watch it to learn about where you've come from. And I think documentaries like this are so exciting and so interesting because there's a sense of, of adventure just by going through these documentaries and learning about our history. There's something meaningful in that because as we learn about our history, we begin to appreciate where we are today in history and our own experience that adds to that history. These sort of uh, uh, genealogy or, or um, DNA testing have been becoming more and more popular in the last 10 to 15 years years and of course with the age of internet and being able to research things at the you know uh, click of a button people are really finding this fascinating that they can go online and with this dna test that you send it off and you can look up your entire family tree you can actually see broken down i've never done one before but you i've seen other people uh, other people's charts and you can see like what country they've come from in the past, like where their heritage is coming from. It's really interesting. 
And uh, some people, by doing this, doing this, um, there's a name for it. What is that? What's the name for this? It's uh, just escape me. It's like a genealogy. I'm thinking of a different word, but that's what it tells you. When people do this kind of thing, they find, find out some pretty interesting things. My friend, John Boston, found his biological mom after 38 years. He grew up, adopted, and after 38 years, he took one of these tests, went, uh, found out who his biological family was. I don't know how they even do that. And then he went on Facebook and through uh, through a roundabout way after a long time he actually tracked down who his biological mom was and I helped produce this little documentary here. it's only 13 and a half minutes long if you want to see it it's really neat it's the video of him meeting his biological mom for the first time can you imagine meeting one of your parents for the first time at 38 years old it's amazing. I, I love the story. I follow their story. And he also found out that he has like all these brothers and sisters and cousins that he didn't even know about. It's like really becoming a part of a brand new family. The documentary is called Reunited. I think if you just type that into Google, uh, YouTube and you may have to add John Boston to that. So Reunited John Boston, then you'll find that this is the the thumbnail for the video if you want to watch it's pretty neat the bible also tells us a little bit of our origins right off the bat in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 it says god created in the beginning god created and then you get all the way down to the end of the bible all the way down to the book of revelation and while Genesis tells us that we are created by God, this topic of creation and creatorship becomes an issue again, actually a big issue. Revelation 14, we read this a couple nights ago, says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And what? Worship. Worship Him who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs of water. In what the Bible calls this everlasting gospel that's going to go out to the whole world, humanity in that gospel, right before Jesus comes, there's an invitation. And that invitation is, come and worship God. Worship the one who created. This statement at the beginning of Genesis and all the way again down at the book of Revelation is a reminder to us of what our origins actually are. Where we came from. That we did not come from apes or from random chance over millions and millions of years, but rather we came from the mind and heart and hand of a loving God. And that's very important for us to understand. But society has slowly sort of drifted away over the years from this truth that God created, that we have a loving God that created us. How did that happen? Back in 1831, there was a famous ship called the HMS Beagle who sailed from Great Britain all the way to the Galapagos Islands, 500 miles west of Ecuador. And on that boat was a famous scientist named Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, after he made the epic journey all the way to the Galapagos Islands, was very intrigued by the fact that there, is, there are so many variations within the same species which led him to promote a rather different view of origins. Instead of saying that God created, now this new idea of macroevolution -evolu became popular. And although Charles Darwin wasn't the inventor of this idea of macroevolution, he definitely made it popular. And the problem with this theory is that all of a sudden, we have a new way of explaining our origins, our background, our history. And this new explanation of where we come from all of a sudden doesn't have any room for God. 
God is no longer part of the equation. We can remove him from the equation and we can still explain our existence. uh, Revelation chapter 14 contains this call to worship, this call back to worship God as the creator. And this call is not made just for one specific, specific group of people at one specific time. It's for all of mankind throughout all time. Revelation focuses on worship because worship will be at the center of the crisis before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in these final days, let's find out what does God have to say about how we worship him as creator. If you look back in Genesis and you keep reading through the first and second chapter through this uh, this. Uh, Story of how we came to being and the story of of God creating this planet You'll see that God actually created the planet in six days day one he just spoke and Light happened. I mean, how does that even happen? I would love to see that and someday I I I will I will I want to see I want to see Jesus. I want to see you create Something out of just the the breath of your mouth He said, let there be light, and light happened. And for the next five days, he was creating things that were beautiful, filling this planet with animals and trees and vegetation and all these beautiful things, all leading up to day six, which was the crowning act of his creative work, his masterpiece, when he created Adam and Eve, the first humans on this planet. God said, let us make Man in our image according to our likeness. And so right there in the book of of Genesis, it tells us we are created. God himself came down to the earth and formed us out of the dust of the ground. He didn't just speak us into existence. He wanted to experience that intimacy with his creation. And so he created us from the dust of the ground and he breathed into our Nostrils into Adam and Eve's nostrils, the breath of life. But after he created Adam and Eve, creation week still wasn't finished. There was still something to come. Genesis 2 tells us what happened. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work, which he had created and made. God created the world in six days. And then he rested on the seventh. Why did he rest? Was it because he was tired? Did he create for six days and think, oh, that was hard work. I need a a break. That is not at all why he rested. He rested because... He wanted to enjoy his creation. The seventh day given at creation would also from that moment forward become an eternal sign for human beings on this planet and a reminder to us where we come from. Every week we are reminded that we come from a God who created us. So let's look at the verses that we just looked at. Let's break it down and look at a few things that God did with the Sabbath. Number one, we see that first, he blessed the seventh day, the Sabbath. Next, he sanctified it or set it apart as holy. Next, he rested on that day. You realize that the only reason we have a seven-day cycle is because God created it? We have a 365-day cycle, which is called a year. Why? How do we know it's 365 days and not 364 or 366? It's because that's how long it takes for the earth to travel, make one orbit around the sun. The same with 30 days. How do we know we have a month? It's because that's how long it takes for the moon to make one full circle around the earth. We have a 24-hour day. How how do we know that? Why is it 24 hours? Well, because that's how long it takes for Earth to spin 
one full rotation on its axis. But how do we have a seven-day week? It's because God created it that way. In the beginning, God created using six days of creation and rested on the seventh. The seven-day Sabbath is an awesome sign of not just, now listen to this, this is really important to understand, because yes, the Sabbath is an important sign of God's creation, but you know what else it's a sign for? It's a sign of God's recreation, the power that God has to recreate. God can offer something to people that no new age philosophy will ever offer. And that is forgiveness and a new start. God is the creator of the universe. But when we accept his son into our lives, and I've been talking about this almost every night for the past like five, five nights, when we invite Jesus into our lives, he recreates us. The old is gone. My heart that's sinful and bent towards sin, Jesus slowly begins to change until we become a brand new person. And the Sabbath, yes, it is important. It tells us, it reminds us of God's creative power. But let it also remind us of the fact that God has the power to recreate as well. You may say, well, <clears throat> every Christian I know goes to church on Sunday. Why is that? If the Sabbath is so important and we're looking at it in, in Genesis and God creating it, why do people go, many people go to church on, on Sunday? I'm glad you asked because tomorrow night you want to come and hear that presentation because I'm going to take an entire presentation to unpack that. Where did this whole idea of Sunday as the day of, of rest and church, going to church, where did that idea come from? Who's behind it? We're going to be looking at that tomorrow night. But to the person who keeps Sunday as the day of worship, I just simply always have one question for, for people who I meet who, who have that, um, who believe that. I would say, just show me from the Bible why. That's all. Just show me. Show me a verse. Show me Jesus talking about it. Show me where it's been changed. That's my simple challenge. Just because, and keep this in mind, just because many other people are doing it doesn't make it right. Does that make sense? It doesn't. And so everything that I'm showing you tonight is from the Bible. That's why I said right from the onset, we are going to be looking at this topic from the scriptures. So you can always, if anybody asks you, you can open the Bible and say, here, this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason. Now let's keep going. When God led the people of Israel out of bondage and slavery in Egypt, they forgot a lot of the things that it meant to have a relationship with God. And so God took them to Sinai, gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and he wrote out the Ten Commandments with his own finger, and he wrote it on tables of stone. And that's significant because he didn't write it in the dirt or the sand, and told people to huddle around, huddle around, take a look, and then a gust of wind comes, and oh, I got to write them again. It's on stone for a reason. I think it's symbolic to let people know, look, this is something that's not going to go away. This is not something that's just for a specific group of people. This is for people of all generations for all time, just like stone is more permanent than dirt or sand. The fourth commandment, we looked at the Ten Commandments last time, so we're not going to go through them again, but the fourth commandment deals with the Sabbath. And I think it's very interesting that God, in beginning that commandment, uses a word that he doesn't begin any of the other commandments with. He says, remember. He says, remember the seventh day as the Sabbath. Let's read about it. It says... Remember, this is the commandment now, reading here, this is the commandment that God gave to the people of Israel by writing it with his own finger. Okay, very, very significant, especially when you look at it through the eyes of the people that were living back then. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall, not, uh, you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. No, uh, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That's how it ends. Do you see how significant this is? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews only. It doesn't say that. The Sabbath of the Lord your God. You know why that's important? Because a lot of people think, well-meaning people, genuine people that I've spoken to think that as soon as the topic of Sabbath comes up, it's this idea that, oh, yeah, 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 that, that, the Sabbath is great. Yeah, it's, the, thing is that the, the thing that the Jews do, it was for them. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the Sabbath is of the Lord your God. It is not for the Jews only. It doesn't say that it was for a specific race or culture. God established uh, the Sabbath at creation. That's why he's telling the people of Israel to remember. Remember the Sabbath. Don't forget it. Long before any Jews were even in existence. He gives it to all people. So we're establishing right now, we're taking a journey, and we're establishing right now that, that Sabbath, the seventh day of rest, was established in the Garden of Eden. And then from the Garden of Eden, if we take a step through history towards our time, we see that God gave it to the people of Israel with this one caveat. He said, please, remember the Sabbath. Don't forget about it. So I want to fast forward now. Let's just run through the pages of Scripture, all through the Old Testament. I want to find out what Jesus' take was on the Sabbath. I want to be like Jesus. I want to follow him. I think that's the safe thing to do as, as uh, people who want to follow Jesus. So what did he do on the Sabbath? Let's look. The Bible says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the what day? On the what day? On the Sabbath. And he stood up to read. Don't you think that if the day wasn't important anymore or there was a time coming that this wouldn't be as important to God, wouldn't he would have said something about it? And yet we have no record of Jesus saying anything about it. In fact, you see that Jesus himself went to the synagogue, went to church, on, on the Sabbath. And so, by example, Jesus demonstrates that this is still important. This was important to him when he was on the earth. We're going to keep going. So, what day of the week is the Sabbath? What if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday? What makes it Saturday? How do we know that it's Saturday? Again, we're going to base everything on the Word of God today, so it's pretty clear. Luke 23, verses 52 and 53, talking about uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and this is right after Jesus died on the cross. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, linen and uh, laid it in a tomb. That was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever been lain before. There we go. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the what? To the commandment. So here we have this, these verses saying that Jesus died on a certain day, and the Sabbath was drawing close, was drawing near. The people that were there to, the women that were there to bury, to help prepare Jesus' body for burial, worked as quickly as they could, but partway through their process of, of helping Jesus' body being prepared for burial, the Sabbath like, just fell upon them. The time was that, that they had to observe the Sabbath. And so they left they were going to come back to finish the work after the Sabbath. They rested on the Sabbath. 
Notice Luke 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So now they're going back to the tomb. What day is it? The first day of the week, it says. So there was this preparation day, and then there was a Sabbath that they observed, and then on the first day of the week, they went back to the tomb. So this is what we have so far. This is the day that Jesus died, preparation day. We call that Good Friday. And then on Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, we observe that as Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. Right in between, we have Jesus' followers, and here's the interesting thing, Jesus himself resting on the Sabbath. Isn't it interesting that Jesus died on a Friday and didn't just raise again on Saturday morning? Even in his death, he observed Sabbath by resting. It's quite amazing how he did that. I mean, that's just, so that's the, the timeline that we have. It's clear, it's in the Bible, so we don't have to guess which day. Maybe it was Friday, maybe it was Sunday. No, it's right there. Saturday was the day of rest according to these verses. The Sabbath was, um, was Saturday, according to the fourth commandment. And so we just established that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, rested from his work of salvation on the Sabbath. 6,000 years ago, God rested from his work of creation on the same day. So what's in it for us, though? What benefit does the Sabbath give us? Why would it be of any value to us? I believe God gave us the Sabbath as a tremendous benefit and blessing to us. Because most of us live very stressful lives, don't we? The stress that we go through is significantly higher than any other generation. And the stress that we go through is putting a lot of strain on our mental health. Did you know that at the turn of the century, anxiety flew past depression as the number one health crisis in this nation? Like just flew past it. Anxiety right now is the number one mental health crisis of this generation. And this like, you know, go, 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 go lifestyle. And this stressful lifestyle is raising anxiety in people. And it's causing a lot of stress. It is stressing our relationships out like you wouldn't believe. This go and rush lifestyle is putting a stress on our marriages on our families, on our kids, and even our relationship with God. We struggle with it. Mark Comer, he writes this amazing book called uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Look at what he says. He says, hurry and love are incompatible. You try to build a genuine relationship with someone based on love, but you're, one of you or both of you are constantly in a rush. He says those two things are not compatible with each other. You cannot build a relationship of love and of genuineness if one or both of you are constantly in a rush. Because genuine love and relationship is built over time, spent to e with each other. And then he says the Hebrew word Shabbat means to stop. But it can also be translated to delight. It has this dual idea of stopping and also of joying in God and our lives in this world. The Shabbat is an entire day set aside to follow God's example, to stop and to delight, he says. Incredible words, incredible depth. The Sabbath was given by God for us so that we can rest and recharge and refuel and reconnect with the things that are most important in our lives. Our relationships with people, our families, and even with, with God. 
So what about the early church? We talked about creation. We talked about the people uh, right after they came, the people of Israel after they came out of, out of Egypt. We fast forwarded. We talked about Jesus. We talked about Jesus' followers all keeping the Sabbath throughout the entire Old Testament and into the New Testament. What about the early church, the people that were around after Jesus left? Did Jesus give them a secret, like a little heads up, a little nudge saying, listen, by the way, don't worry about this whole Sabbath thing anymore. I've nailed it to the cross. What did he say? What, what did the New uh, Testament church uh, do with the Sabbath after he left? Let's read about it. Acts chapter 17. Look at these verses. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three, what? Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Here's another one. Acts 13. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them. The next what? Sabbath. Do you see a pattern happening here? On the next what day? Sabbath. Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. More than 50 times in the New Testament. 50 times. More than 50 times. This word or this concept of Sabbath is mentioned. And not once is it mentioned in context of there being a change. Not once. Clearly, Sabbath was important even to the early church, to the apostles after Jesus left. There's no way that with Jesus' death, it's been done away with. We just don't see any evidence of that. If you have any more questions on this topic... Tomorrow, we're going to unpack what I just said, and it's going to be a really neat study. But for, the, um, f- for some of us, we might be wondering, you know, when does Sabbath begin and end? And so I just want to take just a little detour just to cover this topic as, as quickly as I can. Uh, you will find lots of verses in the Bible, and actually you're going to have some in the uh, study guide that you will get on your way home talking about this, but uh, for instance, Leviticus 23.32 says that Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday night and ends 24 hours later on Saturday night at sunset. So that is the 24-hour period of Sabbath. That has not changed from the beginning. All the way, its roots are all the way back in the book of Genesis when God created um, the world. Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden. Abraham kept the Sabbath. The people of Israel kept the Sabbath. Jesus kept the Sabbath. The early church kept the Sabbath. His disciples kept the Sabbath. And guess what? (laughs) Look at this verse. I love it. Isaiah 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me. This is talking about heaven. Says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one what? One what? Sabbath. To another, all flesh shall come before me and worship me, says the Lord. Guess what? (laughs) It's been kept throughout time, and we're going to keep it in heaven. Why would Jesus come to this earth, die on the cross, and give us a little footnote that says, by the way, between me dying on the cross and heaven, we're going to change the day. I just want to let you know. (laughs) P.S., the day has been changed, but we're going to go back to it when we get to heaven. It's nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere. But I'm showing you verse after verse in the Bible that you can clearly begin to build a case to understand that the Sabbath has not been changed at all. And it's still important for us today. Here on earth, God intended for the Sabbath to be a cure for our stress. That's what God created it for, among other things. Of course, recognizing him as creator is a big one. But it's a benefit to you. It's a blessing to you. It's a protest to safeguard your time and your health against the constant demand on your time from the world. Your boss at work would love if you work 24 hours a day every day of the year. But you have to draw the line somewhere. God is saying, look, I have a plan for you to enjoy one day off a week. One 24-hour day when you can unplug. Just forget about work and stress. What do, you want to, what do you love to do? Let's take out all the distractions. Let's take away our phones. Let's take away our tablets. Who do you want to spend time with? Who can you invest in? Those are the things that matter. Life is so short. 
It's the relationships that we invest in that we will remember the most. It is not how many juju beads, beads we crushed in Candy Crush. It's not anything else. It is simply our, I don't know if juju beads is actually a thing. I just made that up, but I know something about Candy Crush. I don't know. I might have butchered that, but you get the point. It's those, relationship that, those relationships that count. At the end of the day, those are the things that matter the most. And it is a time for you to experience your relationship with God and with your family and the people uh, that matter most in your life. So uh, another question, I've heard this before. People say, well, I want to keep every day holy. Okay, <laughs> you can worship God on any day that you want, but God only made one day holy. And that was the seventh day, the Sabbath. So it's actually unbiblical for you to keep every day holy. Remember, Jesus, God said in the Ten Commandments, in that commandment, he says, for six days you shall labor and do all your work. So in the commandment, he's saying, look, you got six days. Do your work during the six days. Don't just sit back, kick up your feet and say, well, I'm devoting all my time to the Lord. That's not biblical. You have six days and you should work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. So here's something very interesting that I, I, I don't want you to, to take away from tonight's presentation. And that is this. That for some, in some way, and for some reason, I'm, I'm trying to say that the fourth commandment, this commandment about the Sabbath, is a more important commandment than any other commandment that God gave. I'm not saying that. But what I'm also saying, hear me carefully, it is that, it is no less important than the other ten. Many times, many people want to take all nine. They say, yeah, it's good not to steal, not to kill. The Sabbath cramps my style. It doesn't go along with what I would like to do. And I believe that one was nailed to the cross. But I'll keep all the other ones. And that's why I think it's important for us to be honest and just to realize that the Ten Commandments are there and they're eternal. There's no reason for God to change any of the Ten Commandments. There's no reason for God to say, thou shalt not kill, but you can in this situation. And it's the same with the Sabbath. God gave the Sabbath as a gift, and it's going to remain a gift for you. And you can experience that for yourself. Jesus said in, in uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know what's interesting about that word keep? It's actually a future indicative. For those of you who know grammar, it's not an imperative. If you look that verse up in the original language, what this means is, here's the long and short of it. Jesus is telling you and me today, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments is a byproduct of a relationship with God. And if you don't hear anything else that I said tonight, make that the thing that you take home with you this evening. Jesus' goal and his desire is to have a relationship with you, number one. Remember, relationship always trumps legislation. God wants a relationship with you first. And when Jesus comes into your heart and you begin to have a relationship with him, he begins to recreate you and change your heart into something beautiful and something new. And for some of you, that'll happen quick. And for some of you, it'll happen, it'll happen you know, it'll take, it'll take a long time. But that's not the point. The point is relationship. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And when he does, he will write his law in your heart and in your mind, and you will begin to keep it as a byproduct of a relationship with him. I realize that what I'm saying tonight for some of you is new. And if it is, I'm, 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 I want to pray for you because I know that this is tough. A lot of people have grown up learning something and then all of a sudden they're seeing something in the bible that goes against everything that they knew growing up 
I want to encourage you, if, you, if this is the first time you're, you're seeing this and you're wrestling with it, I want to encourage you to go home. Just take it to God. Say, God, what do you want me to do? Lead me. L allow the Holy Spirit to guide me in this. Give me the strength and the courage to follow what your word says above anything else, above all tra any tradition or person or pastor. or Don't take my word for it. I'm sharing with you convictions that I have that are based on the Bible. But you create your own convictions. Talk to God. See what the Bible says. And so with that, I want to make an invitation to you. Right here in this church, this is a Adventist church that observes Sabbath. And so the day after tomorrow is Saturday. And I want to invite you, if you've never been, come and enjoy the experience. Come and see what a Sabbath is like in a church, worshiping with people who are also Sabbath keepers. This Saturday is actually a special day because it's a Mother's Day Sabbath, and so we would love it if you came. We're going to do something special for all the moms and the ladies in the congregation uh, on Saturday, and so it would just be, mean so much if you came and you worship, and uh, I pray that you would be blessed just worship, worshiping with this wonderful uh, church family. Put it on your calendar. It's going to happen at um, 1045, is that right? 1045, the service begins. And so I'm just here to close now with this final story that I find very interesting that kind of is a good application to what we've been talking about tonight. One day in 1975, there was a gentleman who worked in Italy, lived in Italy, who worked at the Fiat plant in Turin, Italy. He would take the same road home every single day. Same road home. He would walk the road. He didn't live very far, and so he walked all the way home. On his way home, he would stop by police, a police auction that happened there every once in a while. And he would love to just stick his head in to see, what's at the police auction today? I would love to see it. Maybe I want to buy something. On one particular evening, as he was walking home and he stopped in to take a look at the police auction, the things that they were selling there, he noticed these two paintings. This is a true story, by the way. Looked at these two paintings and said, hey, you know what? These paintings would look really good above the dining room table in my kitchen. And so he entered the auction. He entered the bidding process. And there was another gentleman there who really wanted the paintings at the same time. So the price kept getting higher and higher and higher. Eventually, he got it, but he ended up paying a little bit more than he actually wanted to pay for these two paintings. He took the paintings, he nailed them to the wall above his dining room, and he thought to himself, wow, I'm lucky I got these paintings. I think they're beautiful. They make me happy. And every day when he would come home from work, he would come and he would see these paintings and they would make him happy. Forty years or so, these paintings hung in his dining room over the kitchen table. By now, he was retired and his son went to college. And one of the classes his son took in college was an art appreciation class. And his son leafed through the book, uh, leafed through his textbook and realized that his father's paintings that he grew up looking at every single day were in this art appreciation textbook. So he called up his dad from far away. He says, hey, dad, uh, you still have those paintings? He said, yes. He said, I'm just curious if maybe those paintings are genuine or authentic. Would you have them checked out for me? So the father said, sure. He called up the local art museum and they sent over an appraiser. They said, well, we'd have to take these into the art gallery to have them tested. And they did. And it wasn't long before the gentleman received a phone call to say that we have the results. So the gentleman went to the art gallery and they had gloves on and the table had a cover over the paintings and they took it off. And they said, these two paintings are genuine. We ran tests and we found that they were genuine. They are by two different painters. One, one's name was uh, Pierre Bonnard, and the other one's name was uh, Paul Gauguin. 
if you recognize those artists. And he said, okay, well, um, this is how much I paid for them. Uh, what are they worth? And the gentleman laughed at it and said, oh, they're worth quite a bit more than that, what you paid for. He says, how much are we talking? They said, these two paintings together are worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $65 million. True story. This retired gentleman for 40 years, for 40 years, had two paintings hanging in his dining room. He had no idea what their true value really was. And I can't help but think that it's the same way when it comes to some of us and the Seventh-day Sabbath. The Seventh-day Sabbath has so much value for you if you would only take a moment to investigate it for yourself, to taste and see how good God is, if you would take that one 24-hour period and give it back to God and focus on the things that are the most important in your life. Jesus wants to come into your heart and change your heart. And he wants you to experience a stress-free life. And maybe stress won't ever go away from your life because, hey, we live in a sinful world. But God wants to give you that temple in time, that sanctuary in time, that special moment in time for you to connect with him and build your relationship with him. And I'm wondering if there are people here tonight, maybe you're one of them, who want to say, I want to experience the Sabbath for myself. Maybe for the first time. Maybe you've grown up hearing about the Sabbath, but you never really investigated it, investigated it for yourself. And Jesus' invitation is for all of us. Come and see. Come and experience Sabbath. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to tonight's message as we've done a couple nights already, and it's with a card. And this is what the card looks like. Number one, I deal with stress in my life. If you deal with stress, check that box. Our prayer team is praying over these cards. Number two, I want to live my life according to God's will. Is it your desire to say, God, whatever tradition may tell me, whatever pastor says, I want to just, I want to go back to following your will for my life. If that's your will, just check that box. Number three, I choose to worship the creator by keeping the Sabbath he created for me. And for some of you, that's a big step. But do you hear God speaking to your heart tonight? Do you hear the Spirit calling you to worship God on the Sabbath? Check that box. This is you telling God, I want to do this because I feel you calling me to do this. And the fourth one is, I would like more information on this subject. For some of you, maybe this is a big decision and you just, you need some more information and we're here for you. Pastor Jared, myself, we're here to help you on this process. Any questions you have, just come to us, ask us. We'd love to help you on this journey. Take a moment. We're going to have the cards passed out. I'm going to ask my friends to pass them out right now as we have a song by Ryan. And then I'll come up and close with a prayer. God took six days and created earth and moon, the stars and sun. On the seventh day he rested from the work that he had done. Then he blessed it, made it holy as a gift for every man to remind us where we came from and just how this world began holy day sanctified enter into joy divine in this temple made of time see him worship on the sabbath as his 
his weekly custom was feel the fury of the rabbis for he would not heed their laws so they killed him on a hillside as the sun began to fade but he even kept the sabbath as they laid him in the grave holy day purified set apart sanctified enter into joy divine in this temple made of time oft forsaken and forgotten desecrated and profaned but the sacred fourth commandment is still valid and unchanged hear the father gently calling if you not for merit or salvation but because you love my son holy day purified set apart sanctified enter to joy divine in this temple made of time you will find joy divine in this temple made of Thank you for loving us so much that you created rest for us. And God, we need it so much, especially in the world that we live in. There are so many things in our lives that are pulling our attention and we get tired. We suffer, God, because our relationships are falling apart and we start to experience health issues. And it's hard to know where to draw the line. And so thank you for the Sabbath because you helped draw that line for us. It's this 24 hour period that you gave us as a gift. Thank you for that gift. And we pray that you would bless us as we venture out into the unknown. And maybe for some people here um, never experienced the Sabbath before. God, I pray that you would convict their hearts and you would lead us all in what we should do with this and, and believe moving forward. I believe it's clear in your word that you want us to enjoy the Sabbath. But I do pray that you would convict our hearts on this and help us to really experience what it's like to experience a day when we can focus on nothing else but our relationships with the people that matter most in our lives, and especially our relationship with you. Thank you again for this gift. We open our hearts this evening and say, God, come into our lives, recreate us, and help us to enjoy keeping your law, not because it's a list of things to do, but because of our relationship with Jesus. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. 
thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, the basket will be at the door for you to drop your cards. Thank you for taking the time to fill out those cards. We take them very seriously. We look over them as uh, with the pastor and we pray over each one. And uh, we want to reach out to you if you have any questions. Uh, remember that, oh, it just escaped. Remember that uh, tomorrow night we're going to be back. And uh, for some reason it's not clicking forward. We're going to be back and we're going to be talking about the topic of why, if, if we just looked at this amazing commandment, why do so many people go to church on Sunday? That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And then Saturday morning, we have a special Mother's Day program. And then Saturday night, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. Heavy, deep, but it has a lot of good news in it. So you have to come and see what the truth is, what the Bible teaches about hell and death. We will see you then. Uh, God bless. Have a safe drive home.